Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mount Vernon. We're glad you're here. I think there are still some folks wandering in from Sunday school. Um, as they do that, and before we go any further in worship, let me invite you to take a moment now, turn around, say hello to the people around you, and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Several announcements, as always, to bring to your attention. Actually, I shouldn't say several. I've only got one here. I'm sure you will have some more, though. Um, first, just a reminder, the stay treat is coming up. There are brochures, again, at the entrances over in Fellowship Hall. You can come for all or part of it. Uh, David Lamott is our speaker and our entertainer this year. He's a musician, so he'll be doing a concert on Saturday night. It is the last weekend of the month. January 31st into Sunday, February 1st. He's also going to be preaching that Sunday morning. So mark your calendars. You can sign up just to give us a rough idea as to which of the portions of the retreat you'll be coming to. Um, I promise you will not be disappointed. So put that on your calendars. What else? Oh my goodness. What else needs to be? Betsy? The, the Martin Luther King Choir. I'm, thank you. Next Sunday, 4 o'clock. Um, is our community-wise, it has got to go down a little bit. Isn't it echoing? Aren't you? We're a little loud. Um, four o'clock is the community-wide Martin Luther King celebration. And we have members of our choir. You guys are going to be singing, right? Some yes. of you? Yes. Next Sunday? So uh, it's going to be at Beth Bethlehem Baptist, just down Sherwood Hall Lane. Put that on your calendars if you're interested in attending. What else? Anything more? No. All right. Let's quiet our hearts. Still all the noisy voices from this past week. And let us come together as a faith community and together worship our God. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly, earthly, and dwelling in us, Father, we give you thanks for love. It is the only solution in this world. I do not like my neighbor, but I need to find a way to love him. If not, what am I? A good person? A kind one? How can that be if I don't put love first? If my neighbor believes in a different God, am I to be thankful that I know you? Always. But I should cry for anyone who doesn't know you. Please remind me to keep love first and foremost. Let us be reminded of how this love can be displayed. Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. He was quoting a commandment you gave the Hebrews in Leviticus. Quote, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. We were and will be strangers at times, let us not forget. You show us this as you blessed Ishmael, Isaac's brother, the son of Abraham. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful. Abraham loved his son, and you blessed him. We have a saying in our house to love each other to the moon and back. Grace decided one day to raise the bar. She said she loved us to God and back. How do we comprehend that? To love someone all the way to love and back. God, may the frigid air smack us in the face and remind us of who we are. We may believe in different things, but let us all love so we can have that in common. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Psalm 136, 1 through 9. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. O give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever? Who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever? Who spread out the earth on the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever? Who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever? The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love rules forever the moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. The word of the Lord. At this time, would the boys and girls come on down front and join me for the children's sermon, please. Good morning, you guys. So we have a children's sermon bag here today. What's inside? You want to take that out for us? Oh, oh my goodness. Actually, I actually know who this is. Well, Olaf. What movie is Olaf from? What? Okay. Who, who is this, though? Olaf. And what is the movie? Frozen, and what is the movie? Raise your hand, raise your hand, and tell me re just briefly what the movie is all about. Because I bet there's some big people out here who haven't seen it. What's it about? About some girl who has powers that she turns stuff into ice, and then she does something by accident, then she makes a big problem. One at a time. Okay, what's her name? Elsa. Elsa. Okay, and 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 and. Does she do good things or bad things? She does good things and bad things. She does bad things by accident, right? Because she doesn't know. She, she, she has these powers, right? 
but she doesn't know how to control it. Do you ever feel like you do things that you really don't want to do, but you don't know how to stop yourself from doing it? Like if, like if you get really mad, you just want to yell at somebody sometimes and you don't know how to stop yourself? Do you ever do that? You want to yell at your brother sometimes? Yeah, I think sometimes we're, I think all of us sometimes feel like that. We, we know what we should do, but sometimes we just get so angry and our feelings take over and we just end up saying things or doing things that we just do not want to, didn't want to do in the first place, that we know aren't right. Well, God tells us that in those times we need to stop, we need to be still, and we need to think about him. A lot of people today are wearing a bracelet that says, does anybody here have on a what would Jesus do bracelet by any chance? No. Sometimes people wear these, these bracelets and it says, what would Jesus do? You found, you should put it back on. Okay, especially when you're with your sister. You threw it away. <laughs> Stuff like that reminds us but in those moments when we get so angry and when, we're, when we so want to say something that we know we shouldn't or that we're going to regret later, we have to stop and we have to say to ourselves, what would Jesus do? And if we do that, chances are we will end up not saying those things that we should not say and maybe saying the things that we should say. Okay? So think about that. The next time you watch Frozen... You think about that, okay? The next time you hear that song, you know that song that's like everywhere that everybody's singing? The next time you hear it, think about it. Think about those times when you don't want to do the right thing and ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Okay? All right. Hey, you watch it three times a day? I know there are a lot of people are, yeah. Well, thanks for bringing Olaf in this morning. Is there anybody down here who's going to be here next week who has not had the bag yet? Has anybody not had... Evan, have you had the bag? No. You guys going to be here next week? Would you like to put something in it and bring it to us? Would you do that? Okay. Great. Let's pray. Um, and then you guys can head back to your seat. And if you are under grade three, you can go to Children in Worship. It starts up again today, okay? You're good. Well, you can go. Let's pray. Gracious God, um, thank you for... Thank you for the example that you give us in Jesus. Help us to always follow it and to be people of love. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, amen. Okay, thanks. You can go back to your seats.
be seated. Did you grasp the words in that hymn? Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, selected verses from chapters 16 and 21. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to you. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, so lie with my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after he had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. And she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. That's when Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me by you be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, your slave girls in your power, do to her as you please. So Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar, and Hagar ran away. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring. For you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Now eventually, Sarai herself conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. And Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. But Sarai saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she bore to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed. It is though Isaac, it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. And as far as the son of the slave woman, Ishmael, I will make a nation of him also. Because he is your offspring as well. Friends, the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord God, now by the power of your Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, 
May they be acceptable, Lord, in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my wife got me three pairs of bifocal, uh, are they called bifocals? Reading glasses for Christmas. And I'm realizing this morning I need to start putting them on during this sermon. I don't know why these words are so blurry today. I ended my sermon last week with a plea. A plea that all religions of the world might learn a little humility and grow in our capacity to love one another, all in the name of the very God that we claim to serve. And as we have moved through this week, I was reminded of those words again and again and again and again. It's what I find myself longing for so much these days, particularly in light of this morning's scripture reading. From the book of Genesis, a beautiful passage about the birth of Islam, the second great religion of the world that we are studying in this sermon series. It's the story of a second nation created by God, holy, dearly loved. And that realization should not cause Abraham or anyone else to be distressed. Unfortunately, the 21st century began with a great degree of distress. Distress that I'm not sure will be matched in many of our lifetime. 9-11 is yet another day that will live in infamy, as may very well the events in Paris this past week. Such evil leaves many of us wondering how and why this distress is ever going to end. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard for us to understand the words of Psalm 133 read last week about people learning to dwell together in unity? Why is that so hard? If the great faiths of the world should be able to do anything one would think we could learn to at least get along with one another, recognizing our common ground and discovering that it is more stable and secure than any challenges our differences may pose. Last week's passage from Chronicles referenced the Jewish people's searching for God and how when they did that, when they searched for God, what happened? Do you remember? What happened when they searched for God? They found God. When they searched for God, they found God. When people truly are searching after God, why is it so hard for us to realize they will find God? Do we think God plays these games with us? hiding from us mysteriously, keeping God's self from us. When people are searching after God, Scripture makes it clear. We find God. Do we forget that? Why are we so convinced that people will only find the God that we have found? The way we have found God. Why do we seem so convinced that only the people who live in honoring God the way we honor God, that those are the only people who really know God? Why is it that we, we are so passionate our, about our belief that only th our theological convictions about God are the right ones and that everyone else's, if they're different, are wrong? If anyone should be working to make this world a better place for all, it should be we people of faith. Because at least when it comes to the three great monotheistic religions of this world, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, the beliefs that we hold in common and our desire to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven, that is more powerful in uniting us than anything that might divide us. 
And yet, sadly, evidence today abounds showing us that this, well, this is not the way we live our lives. Again, this week in our adult Faith in Action class, we learned a great deal about, and Jamil is here. Thank you for coming over and being with us in worship. Thanks for your words this morning. Our goal, my goal, is simply to help us better understand the religions of our world today. Because while there are many differences, and, and we could, the, the differences abound. We know many of the differences. They're, they're lifted up in so many places all the time. But what, what I hope we will begin to see is, as was the case with Judaism last week, and as will be the case with Buddhism and Hinduism, which we're going to look at in a, couple more, in a couple weeks down the road, there is a great deal upon which we can agree. And that is what I want to focus on this morning. So let me start today the way I did last week. Tell me what you already know about Islam. What do you know about Islam? Same God, okay? The same God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They sometimes reference God in terms of Allah, but it is the same God, okay? What else? I, say it again louder. Okay, there, there are uh, two prominent de de denominations, not the only one. Um, Jamil is, what did he say, the sect of a sect of a sect, a minority of a, of a minority. But the two prominent ones are Shia and Sunni. Okay, what else do we know? Muhammad is a prophet. Okay. What else? The Quran is their holy book right here, the Quran. Okay, what else? The five tenets, we're going to get to the five pillars in a little bit. There are five kind of pillars of Islam, all right? What was the first part? You... Yeah, the, the Quran includes, and Muslim faith, faith embraces, did you say all? All of the stories that we have in our Jewish scripture, in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament. Moses, Noah, all the prophets, Jesus, good. What else? Anything else you know about Islam? Ebenezer. They celebrate Eid, which is the fasting, okay? That's going to be one of the, the pillars as well, okay? What? They pray fang the east, which what's in the east? Mecca, right? Okay. The sects, what, what Bill is saying is that the sects have been um, kind of in opposition to one another for a long time. Unlike Christian denominations, which get along so well, you know. Um, but, but granted, there has been war, there have been wars fought. I, I want to respect your comment, Bill, but there's, the sects in every major faith of the world have done battle with one another, killed one another, so it's, it's certainly been part of We have learned to get along differently in Christianity today. Certainly, we're not killing one another. Ireland, they stopped fighting and killing one another a few years ago. So we are, we are making progress in Christianity. It is progress that we hope will be experienced in, in the Islamic church community as well. Okay? What else? Melinda? The Quran emphasizes that the God is loving and merciful. Okay? Somebody down? They live their faith every day. That's an important characteristic of the faith. It's something they're to be living out all the time. They pray five times a day, some three times a day. Okay? Julie? There isn't really a separation for church and between the mosque and the state, if you will. I'm going to deal with that in a little bit as well. Chad? Salvation by works. 
pretty much? Kind of, okay. <laughs> Salvation by works, similar to Judaism, um, which we looked at last week, all right. Glenn, pardon me? The period of fasting, Ramadan, okay. Janet? Pay a, make a, one of the pillars, pay, pilgrimage to Mecca once in a lifetime, if you can afford it and if you're physically able, okay? You guys know tons about Islam. Last, last week, what, three of you spoke, I think. That was about it. Awesome. Oh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, Islam is the faith of the Muslim people. Let's start with terminology. Islam is the religion. Muslim is the name of the follower of that religion, okay? The word sometimes messes us up. It was revealed, the faith, through the prophet Muhammad, whose role in, in Islam is, is very similar to Moses' role in Judaism. Muhammad lived in the late 6th, early 7th century, and so what that tells us is that when you look at some of the religions of the world, particularly Judaism and Christianity, it's a relatively new faith. And as I thought about that this past week, and in light of the scripture reading, I found myself saying, so where were the people of Ishmael for the 2,500 or so years between the story that I read this morning and the birth of Islam? And so in the little bit of research I was able to do, I discovered that we don't really know that. There's not really a lot out there about what happened. The Arab people lived very isolated lives, closed off from much of civilization, and so very, is little, very little is known about the faith that was being practiced or the faiths, plural, that were being lived out prior to the birth of Islam. It's probably pretty fair to assume that the that the pagan faith that was being lived out in many of the Arab countries was no different than many of the pagan faiths living out in various parts of the world. They were telling many of the same stories, most likely, that we revere today. And there were small, unifying groups of people with beliefs and stories that, that began to shape the way they lived their lives. Muhammad is, was believed to have been illiterate. And so in 610, the Arab world was united when at the age of 40, he brought all of Ishmael's people together under one banner. His revelation came outside of Mecca where he had a vision of an angel whose name was Gabriel. Interesting. Who gave him the words of the Quran. And because he was supposedly literate, it is still critical in much of the Muslim world today to believe that the word that was handed down was the actual word from God. Because, Mos because Muhammad couldn't have written any other words. He only wrote what God gave to him. It was direct revela revelation. And so, a literal reading of the Quran is common in some segments of the Muslim community just as a literal reading of the Bible is common in some segments of Christianity today. Now, Muhammad is probably not exalted as much in Islam as Jesus is in Christianity, but he is still central to the faith. His charm, his courage, his impartiality, his resoluteness made him a very charismatic leader. And that set him up to become the, the founder of what is today a worldview of over one billion people. Pew Research from last year revealed, and this was surprising to me, that only about 12% of the world's population are Arab. Many of them believe that only Arabs can be true Muslims. They have a very strong and passionate view of what they believe. But here again, that is 
of the Muslim population in the world today. You may also notice that I referenced a worldview. And I did that because the term religion is, is a little bit problematic. You see, when we think of religion in America today, we separate it from politics. And while I'm not sure how possible that is, and while even though I've only been here 19 months, I think I even preached in several sermons about how our faith should impact every aspect of our life, including our politics, in spite of that, we in America generally acknowledge a, what did Jefferson say to the letter to the Baptists in Danbury? A wall of separation between church and state. We realize that there are certain standards that should be embraced as followers of Jesus, but we don't think the state should throw us in jail when we fall short. In our tradition, that is not how we embrace a faith. And the more fundamentalist strains of Islam, there really is not a distinction between the mosque, and the state. Religious law is state law, often referred to as Sharia law. And that is what has become so problematic in a few parts of the Islamic world today. Sharia law is what exists in the nations of Saudi Arabia and Iran and Brunei and the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and I think it's still even in some parts of the Sudan. And while they vary in the way it's enforced, the degree to which the law is enforced, these countries have no real separation between, again, mosque and state. I was in Williamsburg for a wedding last weekend. And one of my walks through the colonial area, I went to the first Presbyterian meeting house. How many, anybody been into that meeting house down there? I went in, it was early in the morning, and just sat there for a while, reflecting on how things have changed in the past 250 years. In Virginia's early days, in order to vote, you, you probably know this, you had to be a property owner, you needed to be male, and you needed to, what else? Kirsten, she worked there last two summers. You needed to be a member of what church? The Church of England. The tie between church and state was clear and it was rigid, even on the part of people who supposedly came to America for religious freedom. Over time, as with most of the rest of the modern world, we realized that faith involved matters that were sometimes too private and too personal to legislate. And as a result, religious laws were relaxed in this country, and religious freedom has become foundational for our government. It has become a principle that has spread to other parts of the world. Now, this is the case in most of the Muslim world today as well. The separation is there. But sadly, in the nations where this is not the case, they are the ones that get all the press. And it is the Muslims who reject that separation, who behave in a manner no different than Christian fundamentalists or fundamentalists of any other ilk. This is going to be my mantra I'm discovering throughout this series. There are major theological differences between Christianity and Islam, between Christianity and Judaism, and all the religions of the world. But there is far more that we have in common. The vast majority of Muslims are like the vast majority of Christians. And as we saw last week, they're like the vast majority of Jewish people. Unfortunately, it's always the fundamentalists who get the, the, the attention. And just like we, as followers of Jesus, do not want to be defined by the members of Westboro Baptist Church, neither can we afford to paint all of Islam with the same breath, brush that is used by fundamentalists. As far as core beliefs go, Kimberly already mentioned the five pillars of Islam. Do you know what they are? We've heard a few of them. Profession of faith in God, 
Muhammad is his prophet. That's the first one. What else? Somebody, you mentioned a few of them. Praying five times a day. The pilgrimage to Mecca, if you can afford it and if you are able. Fasting. What one did I leave out? Something called the zakat, which is a tax paid to the government so that they might do what? You know? Care for the poor. Care for the poor. Now, if you stop and really think about those five pillars, those principles, you can find something very comparable in the faith that most of us profess. They're not all that radical. In so many ways, they line up very much with our beliefs. Their view of the Quran is similar to our view of the Bible. And the things that are found there are no more radical than some of the things that are found in our Scripture. But as always, it comes down to interpretation and whether or not holy words are read literally or metaphorically. And that's where fundamentalism of any kind should raise flags for us. I ended my sermon last week by by calling us to, again, just learn to love one another. And that is the case again this week. But we can never really love people that we don't know. That's hard. Growing up in Lewiston, New York, about a half hour north of Buffalo, I knew three Jewish people when I was a kid. Three Jewish people were in my high school. Everyone else was a white Roman Catholic, and the majority were Italian. But when I went to AU in D.C., I was surrounded by Jewish people. My closest friends, all of them but one, were Jewish. I think I've shared with you before. I was president of A.E. Pi, a Jewish fraternity. (laughs) Because of those friendships... Because of those friendships, I learned about Judaism, and today I have a great deal of love and respect and appreciation for the Jewish faith. At our Friday Panera group, I think it was you, Jug, who said, you know, he grew up in Pomona, had the same kind of experience, but in, what are you, 93 years old? 91. Sorry, I didn't mean to add two there. In 91 years, Judge, Jug has had encounters with countless Jewish people. And, and, and he now knows what it's all about and he loves it and appreciates it. He, he recognizes that faith as, as the beautiful gift that it is to the world. Some of you live with Jewish people. Some of you have children who are married to Jewish people. It's harder with Islam. It's harder with Muslims because still there are many of us, even in this area, who don't know Muslim people. We don't understand the faith. And as a result, we're a little suspect. We're not quite sure what to make of it. Church, there are people just like us seeking to know God, seeking to understand God, to relate to God just the way we do. And most are seeking to live their lives kindly and compassionately and display a love and concern for others just like us. And while well-intentioned Christians, like Franklin Graham, may naively call them evil, such comments are born in nothing but ignorance. What would Jesus say to the Muslim world? Well, knowing that I dare not presume to have the definitive answer to that question, I think he might say the same thing he said last week to the Jews. Love. Love one another. And don't dare ever think that faithfulness to me can ever be put before loving others. Let me offer a little side here. This is the one of the reasons we Christians need to be so careful with some of the texts that we use from the Hebrew Scripture. Texts that imply God called someone to kill someone. They are stories. 
They can never, ever be used to justify our killing of anyone in an attempt to be faithful. Never. Ever. And I don't use those words a lot. But we, Christians and Jews and Muslims, come from the same great tradition of Father Abraham. And while our customs and traditions and religious rites and rituals may vary, they are offered to the very same God. And when we dare kill one another, because we think that is how God is calling us to behave, he weeps. This morning... As our ushers receive the offering, please don't be distracted. Listen to the words of the choir. Listen to the anthem about loving one another. Let it speak to your heart and to your soul. Allow it to reinforce your commitment to not just peacefully coexist. I'm learning how inadequate This bulletin cover really is. May we not just coexist with one another, but may we live together harmoniously and peacefully working together to build a world full of love. Love one another. For all who love are born of God and know God. That's what Jesus says. Could our ushers please come forward?
Thank you, choir. I, um, I went in when they were rehearsing, and I said, and I heard what they were singing, and I said, oh, you need to end that really loudly, because that's the message. And they said, well, it says piano. We're supposed to sing it softly. <laughs> Either way, it's a message we need, whether it's soft or loud. We need to make this awkward break right now, because we have some business to do as a Presbyterian church, and that is we have new officers that are in need of being ordained and installed this morning. So I would like to invite our three new elders to come forward, and while they're doing that, Jim has an announcement coming from session that I forgot during our announcements this morning. Jim. Appreciate it. Well, as most of you, I think, know, um, we believe that God speaks through us, and God calls people to various positions of leadership in the church through the body, and you have elected four people to serve as the new members of our session. Unfortunately, Mary Wieldy is um, in Ohio still with family who is sick. Robert has had the flu, so we'll be ordained, installing her somewhere down the road, but this morning we have the great privilege of of ordaining and installing both um, Peter Mitchell and Chad Arts to session and installing for his, I think, what, fifth, sixth time on session, <laughs> Chuck Higdon. So as required by our Constitution, let me ask you the questions of all who are ordained in the Presbyterian Church. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbor, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, the unity, and the purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And will you be a faithful ruling elder 
watching over the people, providing for their worship and nurture and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and the justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Having heard their responses to those questions, I ask you this question. Do you, the members of Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church, accept these ruling elders chosen by God through your voice to lead us in the way of Jesus? Do we? Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us serving Jesus Christ, who alone is Lord and head of the church? Do we? At this time, I would like to invite all ordained elders or deacons or trustees in this or any church to come forward for the laying on of hands. Because um, we value the prayers of everyone as a sign of your part in the body. If you're near someone, put your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you and let us together pray for these men being ordained and installed this morning. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for your call upon our lives, the call to each one of us to love as we are loved. We especially thank you for your call to leadership. Pour out your spirit each and every day upon Peter and Chad and Chuck. Open their spirits to your spirit so that they are guided in the decisions that they are called to make. And may all that they do, all that we do, as the body of Christ here, Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church, May it bring glory and honor to you and to your name. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You guys, welcome to ministry in the Presbyterian Church. And ordained folks, you can take your seats whenever you're led to do that. Before our closing hymn this morning, before we go our separate ways, normally we, uh, we spend some time sharing all that's going on in our lives and joys and concerns, but lest we ever think that prayer is just our going to God with everything we want God to do, this morning our prayer is going to be a poem written by Victoria Stafford. If you listen to On Being, early Sunday mornings as I do with Krista Tippett, you will recognize it. It was quoted today by Parker Palmer, who is a Quaker educator and writer, a great spiritual giant in our nation. And he shared this poem, and as we wrestle with all that's going on in our world, um, we need to be people of hope. And that's what this poem is titled, Hope. During this prayer time, 
I, allow, I invite you to just allow yourself to come into the presence of God. And as with all prayer, may it change you. Our mission is to plan ourselves at the gate of hope. Not the prudent gates of optimism, which are somewhat narrower, nor the stalwart, boring gates of common sense, nor the strident gates of self-righteousness, which creak on shrill and angry hinges, nor the cheery, flimsy garden gate of everything's going to be all right, but a different, sometimes lonely place, a place of truth-telling about your own soul, first of all, and its condition. The place of resistance and defiance. The piece of ground from which you should see the world both as it is and as it could be. As it will be. The place from which you glimpse not only struggle, but joy in the struggle. Stand there. Beckoning. Calling. Telling people what you are seeing and asking people what they see. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn.
Now to him who by his Spirit's work in each one of us is able to do abundantly more than anything we hope, dream, or even dare to imagine, to him be all glory and honor in our lives and in this church, now and forever. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen.